Dr. Bumgarner. Thank you for joining Cerebral Palsy Family Network TV. Hi, Lisa, and thanks for having me. There are 800,000 people in the U.S. living with cerebral palsy. It is the most common movement disorder in children, yet research for a cure is sadly lacking. Tell us about your field of study and how long you've been involved in this type of research. What I'm working on is uh, therapies designed to repair nervous system injury. So when I was in medical school, they told us that uh, you were born with every neuron you'd ever have and that the ability for the brain to repair itself was pretty limited so that when you were treating patients that had injuries to the brain, you pretty much had to just deal with what had happened and try and support them through. And maybe over the past 10 or 12 years, there have been a stream of publications that have suggested that maybe repair could be possible, and that got us excited when I was in Houston. And we started doing some stem cell trials for traumatic brain injury in Houston, and since I've moved here, we've uh, extended that to involve kids with hearing loss and also kids with stroke, which is a pretty significant subset of the cerebral palsy population. What are core blood stem cells? And where do they come from? They're considered adult stem cells. Uh, so any stem cell population that is collected from an individual after they're born is no longer considered fetal or embryonic because to be fetal or embryonic, you have to still be in utero. Um, there's a lot of ethical issues that bother a lot of people about using embryonic and fetal stem cells. And so we didn't want to wade into that. And we also wanted something with an established safety profile. And truthfully, right now, there isn't a really good safety profile for either embryonically or fetally derived stem cell populations. And the adult stem cells have a more limited repertoire in terms of what they can do. And that pluripotency is kind of a double-edged sword. So sometimes you can get them to go where you want them to go in animals and turn into what you want them to turn into. But sometimes they have a vote and decide they're going to turn into something that you'd really rather not deal with. Uh, when you put these cells in, they're in there for good and they can last a long time. And so you'd like to have some confidence that you're not going to create a problem. And the nice thing about cord blood and bone marrow derived stem cells is we have that track record based on what's been done in the cancer world. And we're confident that they're not going to create problems for us. What are the possible uses for children with CP? It, it, it depends a little bit on why you have cerebral palsy, but usually it's some kind of uh, perinatal um, central nervous system insult that creates damage to the, to the brain or the spinal cord. And the idea behind this treatment as we're using it is that you enable some degree of repair to occur by changing the immune environment in the central nervous system space. So it looks like under normal circumstances, um, the immune response to the injury of cerebral palsy, which can be very long lasting, is uh, suppressive in terms of repair. And that when you give cord blood or bone marrow mononuclear fraction, we think we're changing the immune system in the nervous system in a way that allows for reparative processes to take place. So maybe we can make things a little bit better for these kids. You're at the Florida Hospital for Children. Can you tell us what's going on with your clinical trials? In the course of cerebral palsy, there's some time points where treatment is possible. Kids that have something called hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, or HIE, experience a pretty generalized insult around the time of delivery. And you can figure out that they've had that around the time of delivery. And there's researchers that are looking into treating that insult in the very acute phase with cord blood. So uh, Joanne Kurtzberg at Duke is doing that, where they, the current gold standard for management is something called cold cap, where they cool these babies. And then they're uh, combining cold cap with um, cord blood that has never been frozen. They collect it at the time of delivery and treat the kids right away with the, the process cord blood to see what's happening. She's also using multiple rounds of treatment in that trial, and, and we're all very anxious to see what happens with that. The next time point at which the FDA th feels that you can call it treatment for cerebral palsy is around two years of age. So there's a multitude of different conditions that can create a cerebral palsy clinical picture, uh, and most of them are difficult to figure out before two years of age, and you can't make the clinical diagnosis in two, until two years of age. So then at that point, uh, treatment is happening. So Dr. Cox in Houston is using both cord blood and um, bone marrow to treat cerebral palsy. There's a trial at Medical College of Georgia that's ongoing doing the same thing. And I wanted to focus on the in-between period, and I also wanted to focus on a slightly less um, global insult uh, than the one you see in HIE. You have children under a year involved. Why is that important? 
So stroke is something you can identify in an MRI scan very early in the stage of a person's life. And so I'm not really calling it a cerebral palsy trial. We're calling it a perinatal arterial ischemic stroke trial because that's exactly what we're looking at. And you can see kids with perinatal stroke present at two ages. One is uh, in the first few weeks of life when they often have seizures in the NICU. And then you see them uh, at 10 to 12 months of age when they start showing the signs of um, cerebral palsy, usually weakness and spasticity on one side of the body. Um, you can do an MRI scan, you can make that diagnosis, so you can initiate treatment in that patient population before the two-year uh, deadline. Our license is from six weeks up, and we're trying to see if the treatment that is initiated earlier than two years of age has any different effect than that uh, that's started later. Some people say it's 27 to 48 or 9 percent of kids with cerebral palsy actually have stroke as their underlying pathology. So it's a pre pretty significant subset of the CP population. For more resources for families affected by CP, sign up for our newsletter at cpfamilynetwork.org and don't forget to like us on Facebook.